Our final reading this morning comes from Paul's uh, first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 3, verses 5 to 15. Hear the word of the Lord. What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and each will receive wages according to their own labor. For we are God's co-workers working together. You are God's field, God's building. So according to the grace of God given to me, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building on it. Let each builder choose with care how to build on it. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one that has been laid. That foundation is Jesus Christ. Now if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, then the work of each builder will become visible. For the day will disclose it because it will be revealed with fire. And the fire will test what sort of work each has done. If the work that someone has built on the foundation survives, the builder will receive a wage. But if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer loss. The builder will be saved, but only as through fire. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our Lord endures forever. Amen. There is a well-known phrase you might have heard, that frequently makes the rounds in leadership or management or political circles. It was coined by President uh, Harry Truman, where he said, it is amazing what you can accomplish if you do not care who gets the credit. Now, this is a great quote. There's a lot of value in this quote spoken by a man who knew what he was talking about. Uh, this is President Truman, and I know, I know history isn't everyone's favorite subject, so to refresh memories, this is President Truman who inherited the presidency after the passing of FDR on the brink of World War II's conclusion. He became the president three weeks before a victory in Europe. He signed off on the use of the atomic bomb despite first learning about it when he became the president. This was a man who is only standing on the great shoulders of his predecessor's legacy. But President Truman knew the other side of it too that we see. All throughout his presidency, he tried to enact a safety net of health insurance for senior citizens. He failed, he never got it done, but 15 years later, a future president, LBJ, uh, signed Medicare into law in Truman's hometown with Truman there in attendance, sharing credit with the man whose idea it had been. It is amazing what you can accomplish if you don't care who gets the credit. Now again, that phrase might be familiar to you, but you might have heard it with a slight variation because 40 years later, President Ronald Reagan would say, there is no limit to the amount of good you can do if you don't care who gets the credit. And see them side by side. And I, I just have to say, plagiarizing a quote on not taking the credit I mean, that is, that is a genius, genius move. Because you know, what's the original author going to do? Get mad at you? Say, I should get the credit for this quote about not taking the credit? I mean, is, he's the great communicator for a reason. That was, in any event here, the power of this quote brings us into the second week of our changeover worship series. Because Paul, as we heard, says something very similar to the Corinthian church. And it's helpful for us as we consider our own upcoming pastoral transition. So as we consider questions of credit, accomplishments, and who really does the work, I want you to invite the Holy Spirit into this place. So our reading from 1 Corinthians 3 open with this line that gets to the heart of Paul's message. It says, what then is Apollos? What is Paul? They are servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord assigned to each. Paul says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. Now, for us, who is Apollos, and why did Paul feel the need to talk about him in this letter? 
It's because the Corinthians, as we've discussed a few times here recently, the Corinthians were a church in a place of profound division and conflict. Uh, From the opening chapter of Paul's letter, it seems that there were factions in this group uh, based on which pastor they liked best. Apparently, some were saying, I belong to Paul, I like him. Some people said, I belong to Apollos. Some people said, I belong to Peter, though there's no record that Peter ever went to Corinth. That didn't matter. Maybe they saw some of his videos on YouTube and say, I like him. (laughs) So Paul asks them sarcastically, has Christ been divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Obviously not. Instead, as Paul breaks down in our reading today, each of these pastors, himself, Apollos, all the others, were servants with a job to do. Paul planted the church. Apollos came in later and, um, as Paul says, watered them, cared for them, but all along it was God who gave the growth. So there's no room for arguing then, as Paul says, in who gets the credit for the growth. God alone gets the credit. Jesus said something similar in our reading from Mark 4 that Connie read for us. In a parable, Jesus discusses a farmer who goes out to scatter seed, and that while he is sleeping, the seed would sprout and grow, and as Jesus says, he does not know how. To reinforce the point that the farmer is not the one doing the growing, God grows the plants while the farmer is sleeping. It's God who does the growth. The farmer does good work planting, but it's God who gives the growth. So again, there's no use arguing over who gets the credit in the church in Corinth, Paul, Apollos, Peter, whoever. Everything that we do in the church is for God's glory and in God's name. So rather, everyone has a job to do that fits us into God's kingdom for good service. That's what Paul says. He calls himself an Apollos, He said, we're servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord assigned to each. All pastors, all leaders in churches are servants assigned for a specific time and for a specific job and purpose. This makes me think of one of my favorite metaphors for ministry and church leadership. Uh, Sometimes you might hear pastors called uh, shepherds, since that's what pastor literally means. But God's flock, I believe, already has a shepherd. He's the good shepherd named Jesus Christ, whose sheep know his voice and follow him. We already have a shepherd. So what are pastors then? Pastors, I like to see it, are sheepdogs. Pure and simple. We've got a job to do, a helpful job and an important job in helping the good shepherd manage the sometimes unruly flock. But the sheepdog never thinks that he or she is in charge. The sheepdog is at its best, his or her best, when they are working in sync with the good shepherd and are happily fulfilling the job assigned to them. So what's happening this month then? We can put it in this context. This uh, this church, our church, in a few weeks will be getting a new sheepdog uh, because your old one is being rotated to another flank of the flock. Uh, this one down in north-central Oklahoma. Now, some things might change with the new sheepdog. It seems like your new sheepdog uh, will be nicer, (laughs) more experienced, and less prone to nip at your heels when you do something that she doesn't like, like your old one used to, right? But you know what won't change? The good shepherd who oversees the flock. It's still his flock and will always be his flock. Anything... That's good that has happened here over the last five years. I've been your sheepdog. As well as anything good that will happen for however long Pastor Emily is your sheepdog, it is God's doing. We've planted some really great ministries here since 2019. From Wednesday Night Live and home groups, pizza in the park and laundry church. And Pastor Emily will come in soon and will water them. Maybe she'll wait a while. We've gotten enough water, I think in our fields, but, and then at some point, she'll probably plant some new things too, and then whoever comes in after her will water those, and through it all, through all the planting and the watering, the pruning, the harvesting, it is God alone who gives the growth. 
This is his church, his mission, his field, and his flock. And so this is our bottom line today, that to God alone belongs the growth. And I'll tell you, I'm preaching a little bit to myself here as much as I am to y'all. I don't know if you know this, if you've met uh, more than a couple pastors, sometimes we get the temptation to be an ego-driven bunch. We frequently, uh, when we get together, talk about pastors uh, who grew their churches. Oh, this was a good pastor who grew his church, her church, up to this size. Oh, this was a bad pastor who, who shrank their church. But Paul is clear that credit for growth belongs solely to God. To God alone belongs the growth. I will say the only growth that pastors can take credit for is when we get together and any time you're in a group of pastors and you ask another pastor how many folks they have in worship, you can safely subtract about 10% from that number to get closer to reality. It's a real hard temptation to, I don't do it, obviously. I'm a, I, I would never do that. That's the growth we can take credit for and it's obviously not real. Now, as we talk about how it's God alone who gives the growth, that doesn't mean that we don't have anything to do. God still calls us to plant and to water. Uh, we still need new ideas to be planted and acted upon, and this church is great at that, coming up with new ideas. Uh, we still need care given to build up our sprouting ministries. Uh, we still need, as well, some failed ideas and some mistakes to be made so we can fertilize the field to give way to new things, that when we learn from the mistakes and failures, the things that didn't work, we learn better for the future. We have jobs to do, and in the midst of those jobs, God will give us growth. That as we, faithfully, as we faithfully execute the jobs that God has given us, God will be coming before, behind, in, and through us, even while we're sleeping, and will give us that growth. This is what Paul means when he writes to another church, uh, the Philippians. He tells them to work out your own salvation. Because Paul knows that God is at work within us, giving growth and enabling us to do that work. So consider this week then, what job God has called you to do. Planting, watering, pruning, fertilizing, maybe weeding or harvesting. There are so many jobs to do and we don't have to keep with the metaphor of planting either. And, you know, this reminds me, too, of what we say every year in our covenant renewal service that we do at the beginning or the end of every year, that in the invitation to that service, the pastor gets up and says this. You know, this is the historic Methodist uh, covenant renewal service. The pastor says, commit yourselves to Christ as his servants. Give yourselves to him that you may belong to him. Christ has many services to be done. Some are more easy and honorable, others are more difficult and disgraceful. Some are suitable to our inclinations and interests, while others are contrary to both. In some, in some we may please Christ and please ourselves, but there are other works where we cannot please Christ except by denying ourselves. And then after the pastor says this, the church responds and we pray, let me be your servant, O God, under your command. I will no longer be my own. I will give up myself to your will in all things. We do these jobs, the jobs God has given us, knowing that God alone gives the growth along the way. Now, it will be a different pastor at the start of 2025 who speaks, reads those words to you in that service but the words will be the same. And the God who hears the prayer will be the same. And it is that God to whom belongs the growth. Let us pray. Oh God, we give you thanks for the examples of your churches and leaders throughout history. For the church in Corinth, for all that they have given to us in the form of Paul's letters. And for the service that your servants, Paul and Apollos and others rendered as you appointed them in ministry. So God, we ask today that you would send your Holy Spirit into our hearts to consider what jobs you have appointed to each of us. Because Lord, there is much to be done in your kingdom. And we know that we cannot do anything apart from the power of your Holy Spirit, but that we also know that you have willed us to work and you have enabled us to work. So God, we pray that we can 
faithfully and fruitfully uh, commit ourselves to the jobs you have given us. For those of us who are leaders in this church, for those of us who are involved in ministries and missions, for those of us, even all of us here now who are worshiping, that we would give all of us into our worship and our service. Lord, we ask this knowing that you hear us, and we pray now in the name of your Son, who taught us to pray in this way, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.